Over to you, Chantal. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Sharon Gerbodi. Uh, we're really excited to hear about her living history. And also just to mention, if you have any questions come up during the course of the talk, please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll try to get to them. All right, take it away, Sharon. Thank you so much, Chantal. Um, wow, it's such an honor uh, to be invited to participate in this living history series and particularly to get to listen to David and Cherry, and I'm looking forward to hearing your presentations yet as well. Cherry and David, I, I read so many of your uh, papers. I also studied colloidal particles and the hexatic phase, Cherry, and the KTHNY theory was my obsession for a couple of years in grad school. So it's it's really such an honor. Uh, Cherry, you were Dean of Seas, I believe, when I was a postdoc there with Maha. and. Um, what a delight to get to be part of this. I'm also only really an honorary, I, I have done a little bit of biophysics, but I feel more comfortable in, uh, in the traditional physics, I must admit, but I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, this is the obligatory photograph of me as a child. <laughs> um, I've really enjoyed watching so many of the videos from these series. And I noticed that many times there is a very cute photo of the person as a child. So I had to stick one in. Uh, this is me with my partner and our children and me in my role as I am now as a professor at an undergraduate institution, Harvey Mudd College, which is located in Claremont, California. Um, so I want to talk a bit today about my academic journey and um, some of the people who really helped me along my way. Uh, so I went to high school at Castilea High School, which is in Palo Alto, California, um, where my drama teacher, Bear Capron, was the most influential uh, teacher that I had there. Bruce Schum was my thesis advisor uh, during my time as an undergraduate at UC Santa Cruz. Itai Cohen was my graduate advisor when I, too, was in the basement of Clark Hall. I was in C Corridor. Um, and so Itai was my advisor there, and Maha was my postdoctoral advisor. There's one other teacher, but I, I can't find any photographs of her. But my first grade teacher, shout out to Mrs. Sims. Mrs. Sims was absolutely wonderful. I've always been a bit of a slow learner and easily distracted, and in first grade, she had to move my seat away from the window because I kept staring outside at the trees. Um, we had these daily exercises that we had to complete before we were allowed to go to recess. And I only went to recess about five times in all of first grade, but it was wonderful because Mrs. Sims had a record player and she would play classical music and it would just be Mrs. Sims and I for a delightfully peaceful time listening to music and looking out at the trees. So. Uh, she was a wonderful teacher for me as well. I wish I could find a photo. Um, so let me take you on a little tour here. These are my high school years. Uh, I was in the class of 1997. Here we are on the right. And that little face there is my face uh, standing next to my best friend, Helen, also pictured down here. Over here on the right is Mr. Capron, Bear Capron my drama teacher, who was uh, an amazing advocate for me. He's pictured there with his husband, Alva. Um, and Bear was an amazing mentor to me throughout my rather tumultuous uh, teenage years. And because of that, because he was such a wonderful teacher, I really loved theater. And so here are some you know, cheesy high school plays that I was in because it was an all girls school. We were always looking for uh, male identified people who were willing to participate in our plays. And so this is me and right next to me here also in this photo um, is our one male teacher who was willing to participate in these plays. And that was Mr. Sean Fattrell, my physics teacher. Um, and I absolutely loved taking physics with Mr. Fattrell. I also loved math, but I just did not conceive of myself as being a scientist. I, I knew that I sort of had a knack for math and that I enjoyed it, but you know, I, I won the awards for writing and for theater and so on. So I figured that I would do those sorts of things in my life. And I went to college at UC Santa Cruz because I thought being in the Redwood Forest was a great place to be as a creative writer by the ocean and in the Redwood Forest. 
<clears throat> in fact, it was the only college I applied to. Um, and I spent the first three years of college, two and a half years as a, a creative writing and theater major. And then in my third year, I had to take a, you know, a science course to satisfy my general education requirements. And I took an astronomy course and I thought, oh my goodness, this is so much fun. And so I decided to switch in my third year, having never even taken calculus, to be a physics major and astronomy minor. Um, I was highly discouraged by everyone <laughs> because it was a rather absurd thing for someone to do. Uh, in particular, I remember one physics professor telling me that the odds of me becoming a physicist were about as good as the odds of me becoming a rock star. I'll come back to that later. Um, but it sort of steeled me and made me want to do it even more. I can't say that I quite majored in physics on a dare, but it's similar. Um, so I did do a lot of studying in my last few years of college to catch up on all the math and all the physics, and it was just an absolute blast. Uh, I loved learning about that, and I got a chance to do undergraduate research um, in particle physics with an experimentalist, Bruce Shume, and we worked on uh, sort of modeling how close to the beam line a detector would have to be to detect supersymmetric electrons. Um, but outside of studying physics, um, I, I struggled a little bit with something that I think I still struggle with, which is how can I simultaneously study what I love and also do something that is helpful in the world? Um, and it was something I struggled with a lot as an undergraduate because to me, studying physics was utterly indulgent. Um, and I worried that I wasn't interfacing with the world of humans and all of the problems in that world. Um, so, so one way I tried to deal with this was um, I volunteered at the Santa Cruz AIDS, Pro AIDS Project for uh, three years during college and actually took a year off after college and before grad school um, and worked there, among other things. But so this is me at my graduation with Timothy and Dawn from the Santa Cruz AIDS Project, who were mentors to me there. And I also spent a bunch of time, indeed, at the beach, enjoying the beach, as I had intended to. Um, after my year off, during which I worked at the Santa Cruz AIDS Project, bought an old motorhome and fixed it up and drove it around the country, the ultimate destination of that drive in the motorhome was Ithaca, New York, uh, where I landed for graduate school and um, started working for this guy named Itai Cohen. Uh, and at the time, he was still a postdoc at Harvard working with Dave Waits, but he had been hired at Cornell. And uh, Mark Buckley, this guy over here in the mask, and I, were his first two graduate students that he hired before he even set foot at Cornell. And it was such an experience for me as an experimentalist because I got to set up the lab along with Mark. Um, in particular, I was in charge of obtaining and helping with the installation of our confocal microscope. I later built uh, the holographic optical tweezers setup that interfaced with our microscope. This is we, me with my friend, Rajesh Ganapathy, another lab mate, after we finally got the laser aligned, tricky to do when it's invisible. Um, and I really had a lot of opportunities there to sort of have ownership over an experimental laboratory space, even though uh, I was just a lowly graduate student. Um, so my work there was on colloidal crystals and defects in those crystals and indeed phase transitions in those crystals, something that I'm still fascinated by. Um, what else did I do in grad school? Well, I didn't actually become a rock star, but I did join a band with some of my friends, uh, lab mates. Indeed, that is the same Mark Buckley from Itai's lab. Um, and the other thing that I did is I had this really fantastic grant through the NSF IGERT program, uh, which allowed me to do some work that was independent of my thesis work. And at first I wanted to study cucumber tendrils because I've been fascinated them, uh, by them for my whole life. Um, but Hi, I was Tara, uh, yes? sorry to interrupt, you just have a few minutes left. Thank you. Um, 
So I tried to grow cucumber plants and couldn't keep them alive. Uh, but I learned that I could keep a plant alive long enough for it to grow some roots and I grew it in some clear gel and, and made a little imaging system to be able to image actually in three dimensions, though I'm just showing you a single view here, image a plant root growing over time and interacting with obstacles. So that was sort of my first step into the world of biophysics. Um, I also had the opportunity to travel to India for a winter school at IIT Kanpur uh, in 2008 with uh, Dr. Sandeep Tivari. So it was a group of us from Cornell. Uh, we worked with a group of students from IIT Kanpur and we took classes in a traditional setting at IIT Kanpur, but there was a second and for me more memorable portion of this winter school which was in rural India, where we studied technologies in rural villages. And we had the opportunity to actually stay in a couple of villages. And this is me learning about how to make breakfast um, in a setting that was very different from the kind of kitchen that I was familiar with. And so we, we drove around in our bus and got a chance to really experience something that was different um, and, and very valuable and something that we learned a lot from. Another thing I had a chance to do during graduate school that actually pushed me toward the career that I'm in now was I had a chance to do some work in uh, the criminal justice system as a teacher. So first I uh, did a weekly tutoring program at Lansing Residential Center, which is a juvenile detention center for girls that's very near to Cornell. Um, and I did a tutoring program there and found it very rewarding. And then uh, I, along with two other graduate students, uh, they were in applied physics. Um, the three of us put together the first physics course that was taught through the Cornell Prison Education Program. And it was taught here at the Auburn Correctional Facility, which is a maximum security prison for men about an hour away from Cornell. And uh, it's rather foreboding, as you can see. And this aerial view I wanted to show because would park down here and after I got through security, um, though there were two other teachers, each of us came alone. And so it was just me with a guard walking across this enormous yard uh, to the back. This was the building where we actually taught. And my students were absolutely amazing, dedicated, appreciative, and very curious students. And working with them made me decide that I wanted to be at a teaching focused institution, or at least at an institution where teaching was truly valued um, and not just seen as a distraction from research. Um, this brought me to Harvard University for my postdoc because I was specifically looking for ways to do uh, low cost experimental tabletop work. Um, so although I was very interested in single molecule biophysics, I knew that wasn't the sort of thing I'd be able to afford at a small undergraduate institution. And I was very lucky that Maha was willing to take me on. He had just gotten a small lab space, even though he's really a theorist, and he was willing to let me set up a laboratory space and um, work on understanding shape and growth of these beautiful uh, nectar spurs in Aquilegia flowers. Um, and he also let me study cucumber tendrils and found me a plant biologist, Josh Pusey, who was actually able to grow the plants. Um, and I had just a delightful time being able to study uh, the biomechanics of these tendrils, how they change shape and what sorts of springs they are once they form. Uh, finally, I got my position at Harvey Mudd College, which is a 900 student uh, college with only STEM majors, and where my life's work in this career is now uh, creating young scientists who go off and do wonderful things. This photo at the bottom right is from March meeting this year, uh, where I was able to connect with many of the alums from my research group. There are also um, two of my colleagues from Harvey Mudd College and some of their research students there as well. And this has been a shift in focus from just trying to uh, get as many grant proposals as I can and publish as many papers as I can, although doing so is still a lot of fun. Um, but it's become more of a focus on cultivating the next generation of young scientists and 
you know, making sure to let them know that it is possible for them to become physicists, no matter what their background might be. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Sharon. That was a really captivating and inspiring talk. Um, do we have any questions from anyone right now? Um, I know we're running really short on time, so it might be possible to just kind of um, keep it in the chat if anyone wants to kind of let thoughts ruminate for the next few minutes. Um, I asked Sharon a quick question. Chantal, if that's okay. okay. Yeah, of course. Uh, Chantal, um, sh sorry, Sharon, can you please quickly tell us post pandemic and through the lens of your own personal journey, what gives you most hope and most despair as you train the next generation of physicists, scientists? Oh, thank you for the question. I think the hope is still from the unending curiosity and energy that these young people bring. Um, especially when I'm working with my research students, it's so invigorating. Um, that hasn't changed. I think what's difficult and what has changed is this uh, Zoom generation of students who are less likely to be in the classroom at all and less likely to sort of be in the physical world. <laughs> um, and this extra layer of Zoom between us and the physical world, I think, is is something that concerns me. But, um, you know, it's nothing up against that energy and curiosity uh, that's driving these young people forward, as far as I can tell. Thank you. Hey, uh, thank you so much. Um, I guess I can 